Well, we come tonight uh, to the book of Numbers, and uh, last time in Leviticus, we saw the period of time when all the laws and everything were given, like, you know, after Moses has received the Ten Commandments and, you know, all the laws and that on Sinai. And so they've come out of Egypt, and they've been a year or so now in the wilderness, all at the same place in Mount Sinai. And as we move on to the book of Numbers, basically, what we're going to see tonight is the, the next 38 years of Israel's wanderings in the wilderness. What you've got is they come out of Egypt, and you know, there's a year or so at Mount Sinai, then you get the 38-odd years that we're going to deal with tonight, and then at the end of it all, you get another year when they're kind of preparing to actually go into um, the Promised Land. So tonight, we're dealing with the main time that Israel were in the wilderness, after Mount Sinai and until they get to the point when they're about to go into the Promised Land. And so at this point where we pick it up in chapter 1, they are still at Mount Sinai. Um, you know, the law has been given and all, all the period of time and everything that Leviticus covered has all been done and established, all right, and, and, and so they're they're sort of like very close now to moving on for the rest of their journey through the wilderness. And um, so, in effect, we're returning tonight to the historical narrative. We had Genesis, then we had Exodus, all right? Exodus ended them up at Mount Sinai, and Leviticus covered all the laws. Now we're picking up the history again that ended when we got to the end of Exodus. Now, this book takes its name, Numbers, from the fact that um, it starts off with a census of the people. So the people, the nation, are numbered in the wilderness. And also, we'll see as we get to the end of it, it ends with a census of all the people as well. So that's why in our Bibles this book is called Numbers. Um, however, the Hebrew Bible has a different name for it. And um, the Hebrew Bible names this book Mebidbar, um, and that means in the desert. So that's also a very good name, you know, because obviously it's the wilderness wanderings of, of the nation. And, uh, you know, so that's the context. So here we go, chapter one, eyes down, for a full house. Um, in chapter one, you have the census. And um, this is taken to establish the number of males 20 years old and upward. So the actual number reached, all right, were the number of 20-year-old male Jews, 20-year-olds and upwards. The idea being that these were the available males to fight in the army. And the actual numbering of Israel at this point was 603,550. Now that was men 20 years and upwards. So you can see the whole figure, by the time you take women, children and teenagers, was a pretty massive horde of people. So you mustn't think that there was this little gang of people, you know, rather like, say, a largish church moving through the wilderness. This was a massive nation. I mean, you're dealing with seven figures here, a massive number of people. However, the Levites also weren't included um, in this census um, because they were set aside to the priestly service in the tabernacle. So the Levites, they didn't fight. They weren't available for the army. They were running the tabernacle. And, uh, you know, so therefore, you know, we've got the people are numbered here. And uh, you remember how the priesthood was set up, that Aaron, the brother of Moses, he was the high priest, um, and his, his direct descendants were the actual priests. So all the male descendants of Aaron were the priests, and the rest of the Levites were the assistants to the priests. So, you know, sort of basically, chapter one, you have the details about this census. All right, 603,550 males aged 20 years and over. Now then, in chapters two to four, you're going to have to use your imagination here, so I've got to try and describe something to you pictorially. In chapters two to four, we have the instructions that God gives them for the manner in which they were to continue the rest of their time in the wilderness. And there are specific instructions for how they were to arrange the camp when they were camped in a particular place. And also how they were to march when they were on the move. All right. So what God does here, he gives them plans for when they're camping, who camps where, and when they're marching, kind of who marches in what order. 
So it's sort of like, you know, we're coming onto a very kind of military arrangement here, and you'll see why very shortly. Now, first of all, we'll do how, how it was, the instructions that God gave them for how they organised the camp when they were camping. I mean, you know, think of it like when, when you used to go camping with the scouts. Of course, I know that all of you here with your wholesome backgrounds were all scouts, of course. And, uh, you know, but I was nevertheless. And it's like when you go camping in the scouts, you've got your various <coughs> patrols and it's like, our oh, Kayla lays it all out so everyone knows whose tent is where. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. Now, we've got to remind ourselves, okay, that Israel was broken down into 12 tribes. Remember, uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons from which came the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, at this point, we've just got to um, underline in our minds the naming of the actual tribes, because there are one or two changes here, all right? And you see, what you've got is that the tribe of Levi because it was the priestly tribe, is no longer counted now as a tribe. I mean, it is a tribe, but it doesn't figure in the tribal arrangements. So you've got the 12 tribes of Israel, but you've got to take Levi out, because that was a very exceptional tribe. They were the priests, all right? And so what happens, from this point onwards, there's no tribe of Joseph. The tribe of Joseph is represented by Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Levi drops out, Joseph drops out, but Joseph is represented by his two sons, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. So you've still got 12 tribes, but the 12 tribes now are Naphtali, Asher, Dan, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Reuben, Simeon, Gad, Benjamin. Now what should come next is Levi and Joseph, but there's no Levi, right? But Joseph is represented by the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. So you've still got the actual 12 tribes. So they marched and they lived together in their tribes. Now, when they camped, all right, you've got to start picturing now. They set the tabernacle up. And of course, we, you know, went over the descriptions and, you know, the size of the tabernacle, etc., etc. Now, what you've got to imagine is that you've set the tabernacle up, all right, and at one end, you've got the Holy of Holies, and at the other end, you've got the altar of the burnt offering. Now then, when they made camp, they set the tabernacle up, all right, with the Holy of Holies kind of to the west, the altar of burnt offering to the east, so the tabernacle was facing east, and it was facing what was obviously going to become the Holy Land. So then, what you're doing, okay, you've got a picture that you're standing, or you're looking down from a helicopter on the camp, there you've got the tabernacle, all right? And you've got the Holy of Holies to the west, and the altar of the burnt offering facing the east. Now then, if you stand in front of the altar of the burnt offering and face the Holy Land, face the east, all right? This is the way that the tribes had to camp. Directly east, standing in front of you, were the three tribes of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. So they had, if you like, one side of a square, or one side of a rectangle. And so they camped out there, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Behind you, out the other end of the tabernacle, facing the other way, I bringing up the rear, if you like, you had the tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Then, to the left of you, you had the tribes of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And then, to the right of you, you had the tribes of Gad, Simeon, and Reuben. So then, what you had, picture, you're up in a helicopter, you're looking down on the tabernacle, and spread out all around it, to one end, all right, you know, you've got the length, all right, one end, you've got Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the other end, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, and then the two sides of the rectangle are Naphtali, Asher, and Dan, Gad, Simeon, and Reuben. So you've got a pattern there. And every time Israel kind of um, made up the camp, you know, they sat down and set all their tents up and settled down to live somewhere for a while, this was the pattern in which they had to arrange their camp. And that was a pattern that they stuck to all the time. God said to them, that is how you are to make your camp up. Okay. Now then, also, I got to realise that the tribes, as we're seeing here, they're broken down into four triads. So you've got 12 tribes, 
and they're broken down into four lots of three tribes, all right? Because you have three tribes on each side, like, you know, a rectangle, and each side of the rectangle was three tribes. So they're broken down into four lots of three tribes. Now, each of these four triads had a leading tribe, all right? So, you had Dan, Asher, and Naphtali, with Dan being the leading tribe, all right? So Dan was in charge of Asher and Naphtali. Then, you had Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, with Ephraim being the chief tribe. So Ephraim was over Manasseh and Benjamin. Then you got Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, with Reuben being the chief tribe in that triad. And then you had Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, all right, with Judah being the chief tribe over that triad. So now we've got to use our imaginations, and now we've got to see the instructions for how they had to arrange themselves when they were marching through the wilderness. So when they were travelling, there were specific instructions for how they did that as well. And it worked like this. When they were to travel, the Levites went first. They were kind of out in front, all the Levites. And the Levites travelled out front in the direction that they were going, and they would be carrying the Ark. Now then, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, sort of like the treasure chest, uh, you know, that was to eventually end up with the tablets of the Ten Commandments in, etc., etc., and various other bits of pieces, a bit of manna ended up in it, and also, as we'll see later on, Aaron's rod that budded, and you'll see about that later. So the Ark was, was very particularly... The, the, the sign of the presence of God with them. So the Levites, they travelled first, carrying the ark. Now, behind them marched Judah, Issachar and Zebulun. The chief tribe of that little triad being, of course, Judah. So this makes Judah really the head tribe of the whole lot. Now then, the significance of that being, obviously, that Messiah, Jesus, came from the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Raw, raw. So, a little bit of the old Toronto blessing there for you, jacked in for nothing. Okay. So, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, they're marching side by side as tribes. I mean, you mustn't think of them, you know, sort of like all being shoulder to shoulder. I mean, this was spanning out. I mean, it's probably a mile wide or something. This is a lot of people marching. But nevertheless, that was the triad that came first. You had Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun out in front, the Levites carrying the ark. All right? Now then, next, you had the triad of Reuben. Sorry. After Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, all right, then you get a group of people who were carrying the tabernacle. So this was the actual tent, all the tents and all the poles which together made up the tabernacle or the temple. And uh, they, they were carried by um, particular families in the tribe of Levi, in particular the Gershonites and the Merorites. So within the tribe of Levi you had another family subdivision and you had all the descendants of Gershon and all the descendants of Gera. And they were carrying the tabernacle, all right, and they were Levites. So you've got kind of the actual Levites and the priests out front, and then you've got more of the priestly assistants, and they're carrying the actual tabernacle. Behind them comes Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, all right? Behind them come yet another family division within the Levites, and it's the Kohathites, all right, the descendants of Kohath, and they're carrying the tabernacle furnishings. So they've got the furniture all the candlesticks and the, 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 the altar for the burning of the incense, they're carrying all that, okay? So that is in the middle. You've got two triads, then you've got this right in the centre, and then you've got two more triads coming um, after them. So you're seeing at every point, you've got God out front, and you've got God all the way through, and you've got God right in the centre. Can you see that? You've got the ark out front, then you've got the first lot, of the tribes, then you've got the tabernacle, so there's God there, and then after the second lot of tribes, you've got the actual furnishings of the tabernacle. So you've got this picture that, you know, God is spread throughout them as they're marching. You know, God is, is leading on out front, I mean, he's, he's all the way through it, all right. And so after the tabernacle furnishings, you get the third triad, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, and then bringing up the rear, you get the tribes of Dan, Asher and Naphtali. 
So what you've got there is a very strict pattern for how they were to organise the camp when they were settled somewhere and how they were to organise themselves when they were marching, when they were pressing on towards the Promised Land. And of course the important thing to realise in seeing this is of course God is a God of order. Everyone had a place and there was a place for everyone. And the tabernacle is central to the whole thing because of course at the heart, the centrality of our lives as God's people is worshipping and serving the Lord. And notice that these layouts are military layouts. And we saw that it kicked off with a census of all the people who could fight in the army. And of course it's a picture there of spiritual warfare. I mean these guys were marching to warfare when they eventually got to the promised land they had the Canaanites to kick out. And so it's a picture of spiritual warfare as well. So we see that God is a God of order and that he has a place for things. And, and of course we read in the New Testament, don't we, that, you know, sort of let all things be done decently and in order. We see very much the rage today, you know, sort of it seems to, you know, to work amongst Christians. is a very kind of, oh well, just as the Spirit leads, brother. And there's a kind of a, 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 a disorganised chaos all over the place. And everyone's just going as the Spirit leads. Now the point is we must go as the Spirit leads. But here we have a picture of the fact that the Spirit, through God's written word, laid down a pattern that God wanted his people to follow. And of course for us, Old Testament and New Testament, it is the pattern of how God wants our lives to be, both individually and corporately as the people of God. So there we've got order. It doesn't mean that we've got to have everything so ordered that everything is screwed down tight and nothing has got any leeway at all. Obviously, as the Lord leads, sometimes you do get a bit of chaos here and there, but the general pattern was that God had an order to things, and in those chapters he gives them the instructions for even how they were to set up camp and the order in which the various tribes were to march relative to each other and the ark and the tabernacle and the furnishings, etc, etc. So that, that, that's chapters 2 to 4. Then we come on to chapter 5 and you get in, in chapter 5 various laws that were introduced to protect the camp from ceremonial defilement. Remember we saw last time in Leviticus that throughout the sacrificial system that you had kind of physical perfection and cleanliness was a sign for holiness and physical imperfection and getting dirty was a sign of sinfulness you know and hence all the ceremonial washings and stuff like that and uh, I mean it's sort of here it covers things like uh, skin diseases you know sort of who qualified for being banished ceremony and who didn't um, it covered contact with dead bodies um, it covers also just things like um, you know, sort of how they were to go about confessing their sins to each other and uh, where in certain instances if you'd offended a brother or sister in a certain way that maybe you had to make restitution. So if someone had been caught fiddling somebody then they had to not just return the money that they'd fiddled but they had to add a fifth to it or 20%. And so we get there a picture of the fact that in confessing sins to each other, which is important, the point is there needs to be restitution. You've then got to do what you can to make it better with that person, all right? I mean, I mean obviously, if you've, you know, sort of like, if, if they've murdered somewhere, well, you know, someone, there wasn't much, that, you know, how do you make restitution to someone you've murdered? But I mean, the point, you know, because they're gone, but the point is there were many sins that they could commit against each other when the Lord showed them the principle of, of restitution whereby, yeah, it was a question of saying sorry, but then doing everything they could, um, you know, in order to make things right with the people they sinned against. And we, we saw that, didn't we, in the festivals um, in Leviticus last time. And uh, then, then that chapter ends with in instructions on how to establish whether your wife is being unfaithful, <laughs> which is a... Uh, I'll leave you to read that yourself, see if you can spot the signs. Right, now, in chapter 6, you get the teaching on the Nazarite vow. You know, the Nazarites, the teetotal long-haired ones. Um, it was a voluntary vow. Uh, they, they, they weren't to put a razor to their, their, their hair or their face. So, you know, they had long hair, which of course wasn't the, new, the norm amongst the Jews. That was the whole point of it. The Jews had short hair, so did Jesus. The Nazarites had long hair specifically as a sign that they were different from the others. And uh, also they were teetotal. They weren't allowed to go near wine or booze of any kind. And uh, also they were prohibited from touching a dead body, even if a loved one died. So even if their wife died or their mum or dad died, they couldn't actually touch the dead body because they were set apart for God for special service. And it was a voluntary vow. 
Um, you know, so I mean, the point is that if you felt God was calling you to be a Nazarite, it obviously, it doesn't apply today. You know, but if they felt that God was calling them to be a Nazarite, they could become one and for a certain amount of time and then end it. You know, so it wasn't that you were a Nazarite for life necessarily. It was a voluntary vow that you could begin and end according to how you felt God was. Um, leading you and uh, then you get some teachings about the blessing you know that the priesthood could confer upon Israel when Israel was being faithful to the Lord now then in, in chapter 7 to 8 remember they're still at Mount Sinai all right at this point they're, they're still there and chapter 7 to 8 we have for the first time uh, the erection of the tabernacle now for the first time they've made the tabernacle all right but they've never actually set it up now for the first time they set the tabernacle up they pitch this tent, this portable temple. And what happens is that the, the leaders of all the tribes, because all the tribes, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel, they all had like leaders from the head families, blah, 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 like the elders, as it were. And what happens is that the tribal leaders, they bring all manner of gifts and, and carts and oxen and stuff like this, so that they provide everything that's needed in order for the tabernacle to be transported in this long journey that they've now got in front of them through the wilderness. So, you know, again, one's, one's got a picture there. You know, the tabernacle, you know, a picture of the presence of God. But the point is, God is amongst us. And, and that is one half of the picture. But the other part of the picture is that if God wants to move through us, because here we're looking at, you know, the tabernacle being transported, moving. If God wants to move through us, then we have to present to him the sacrifice of our bodies. We've got to sacrificially give ourselves to him so that he can move through us. And so here you've got the leaders of all the tribes bringing all the gifts needed so the tabernacle could be moved um, through the wilderness. And also in chapter 7 to 8 you get a, a special kind of thing that goes on where you get the Levites consecrated and purified uh, because now for the first time they're actually starting, if you like, their tabernacle um, service. You know, so we've seen in... in, in in past books all the instructions for the tabernacle and we've seen the instructions a couple of chapters ago for how the tabernacle is to be transported but now for the first time they set the tabernacle up and the Levites and all the priests are now inaugurated if you like um, into the duties that they have to perform surrounding the tabernacle and then in chapter 9 we have the celebration of the second feast of Passover Remember, the first time was the night when they left Egypt. They ate the Passover. And, of course, you remember that the Passover as a meal was to be eaten with, you know, like your, your tunic tucked into your belt and with your, your sandals on and standing up and ready to go on a journey. And originally, because they were getting ready to leave Israel, uh, sorry, to leave Egypt and go out into the wilderness, and, of course, now they're on the eve of setting out from Sinai, where they've been for a year or so, and their wilderness wanderings are about to begin. And so they celebrate the second Passover, um, as it were, getting ready for the next stage of their, their journey. And uh, what happens now is that they, they've set up the tabernacle, they celebrate the Feast of the Passover. And what happens now is the, the Shekinah glory, this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, you know, the Shekinah glory, as the Jews called it, this presence, this manifest presence of God with them. Uh, this um, Shekinah glory now moves, as it were, into the tabernacle. It settles on the tabernacle. You know, obviously God's saying, right, I am now dwelling with you. The tabernacle is my home for the duration of your wanderings in the wilderness. And, um, and of course, what, what happens from this point onwards is that when that cloud, you know, be it sort of cloud, it's that pillar of cloud by day and, and, and fire by night, when that cloud moved, they knew it was time to strike camp and go. When the cloud settled somewhere, they knew it was right to set up camp. And so the point is that that, that from this point onwards they might be somewhere for a few weeks um, but on the other hand they might be somewhere only for a few days so they, they pace themselves purely by the moving of this Shekinah glory the pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night and of course it's, it's a picture for us isn't it that, that we've got to follow where the Lord is leading you know, I mean, there are times, as it were, where the Lord isn't leading everywhere and everything is just as it has been. And then there are other times in regards to whatever. The Lord says, look, I'm moving you on in regards to this. And obviously, when, when God moves, we follow. When God remains put, we stay put. But when God moves on, we follow. That's the picture here. And that was how Israel knew what direction to take. All these wanderings through the wilderness, well, they were following the cloud. They were following 
what God was doing, how he was leading them. Then in chapter 10, you have the fact that two special silver trumpets have been made by the craftsmen, and uh, the, these trumpets are now sounded. They're, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like they're played by the priests. And what happens here is it's at the sounding of these two special trumpets that have been made um, that, that, that these trumpets now denote that it is time for them to move away from Sinai and begin the next part of their journey, their wilderness wanderings. And uh, in fact, in, in Israel's subsequent history, from this day onwards, these trumpets were also used to signal the need to go into battle. So if Israel was about to fight a battle, it would be the sounding of these two trumpets by the priests that would give the word for the soldiers to go, start the attack. And also, these trumpets were sounded to begin various feast days. And of course, it ties in very much with the Feast of Trumpets that, that we saw last time. And, uh, you know, sort of noted that, you know, that, that, that throughout God's um, work in history, that kind of like, you know, trumpets represent a next phase of what God's going to do. And that is why the next prophetic event to happen, the rapture, is going to, as it were, happen at what the Bible calls the last trumpet of God. It's, you know, they're, they're going to trumpet sound in heaven, and that is going to denote that the rapture happens, and the next prophetic phase, the Great Tribulation, Israel being gra grafted in, happens again. So these trumpets are sounded to signal the fact that Israel now moves on into the next <coughs> stage of its following the Lord, as it were. And um, so off, off they go. Um, of course, with uh, Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, these tribes in the lead, immediately behind the ark. So now, they've had the instructions for how they're to march, and so now off they go, the Levites in the lead with the ark, um, followed by Judah, Issachar and Zebulun, and then the others all behind in their allotted spaces. And of course, the fact that Judah, Issachar and Zebulun go first, and the fact that Judah was the chief, ch the chief tribe of that little triad, um, immediately... Um, you know, speaks to us of the fact that Jesus is always at the head. As we travel, it's Jesus we follow. As Israel followed the Shekinah glory, all right, the tribe of Judah went first. Jesus was the line of the tribe of Judah. And it's a picture that we follow as he leads. Jesus always goes first. We follow as Jesus leads us. And, um, and so we, we have now the, the journey to the Promised Land begins in earnest after this year at Mount Sinai, uh, receiving the ten, you know, like the, the Ten Commandments, the law, the sacrificial system, the feast, blah, 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 the whole caboodle, everything that we now know as the old um, the covenant has been received, and now they move off right, on their journey. And what happens is that now they, they, they move off for three days before they set up camp again. Now then, chapter 11, all right, we're now into the wilderness wanderings in earnest, and they've been going for three days, all right, and now they set camp up. So, the three nights that they've been going, they just like all climb in their sleeping bags, but now, after three days, the Shekinah glory has stopped and they set the camp up, according to the pattern that God gave them back in chapters 2 to 4, all right. So, they're three days into their journey, and they start moaning and groaning against God. Woe is me. Everything is wrong. And all the people, this great tumult goes up, all the moans and groans of God's people. So what happens is that God sends a judgment of fire. And quite a few of them are killed. God sends fire amongst them, and loads and loads of the people are actually burned up in that judgment because of all their burning. And they, they actually called that place Tabera, which meant burning. So, so this place where they settled for a bit here, and God judged them for all the moaning, they called it Tabera, which means burning, because of the judgment of fire um, that God sent them. And um, then they move on, and after a while they settle somewhere else, and then they, they start moaning about the manna. Do you remember we saw the manna? You know, it means what is it? And that was their staple diet, you know, very nutritious, very nice, no great problem. But they start moaning about it. And, uh, you know, and they start saying that back in, Israel, you know, back in Egypt they had fish, and uh, why couldn't they go back to Egypt and get their fish? They forgot that when they got their fish, they were also slaves, and they were being beaten and whipped by the taskmasters. Very short memories there. But, you know, they were crying out, oh, you know, why can't we go back to Egypt? You know, we're fed up with this manna. So, so then, what God does is he, he sent them quail, which, which of these birds, all right? So they get their quail, you know, and they cook it and eat it. And, um, but then, when they'd done that, God judged them with a plague for eating the quail. The, you know, the point being that, you know, that God had made it very clear to them 
that they were to eat the manna. That was the way he was going to provide. And of course here they are saying, well look God, you know, it might be what you said, but it's not good enough for us. This is what we want. And so God gave them what they wanted and then sent a judgment on them. And of course there's a kind of a picture there because I mean, if we step out of God's will, in whatever, I mean willingly, I mean, you know, I'm not meaning when you stray out of God's will accidentally, but if we willingly go against God, okay, and, and, and take what we want rather than what we know God wants for us, it will always have, as it were, a built-in judgment. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, it is not God's best. And we will always regret willfully stepping out of God's will. We always will, just like they did here. And, um, and so they, they called that place Kibroth Hatava. Right? And that means graves of craving. And they called it that because God had judged them. They, they'd craved quail rather than the manna. You know, sort of like, you know, Lord, we want something better to eat than this. And uh, many of them had died and, you know, been buried there. And so uh, they, they called the place graves of craving. And I mean, it's rather, you know, sort of like you've got a, a kind of, um, you know, the other side of that with Jesus in the wilderness, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. There's nothing wrong with wanting something nice to eat. And there was nothing wrong, as it were, with bread. But Satan came along and tried to get Jesus to turn stones into bread. And there's nothing wrong with bread, there's nothing wrong with being hungry, but precisely at the point when his father wanted him to be fasting. And, you know, so, so really, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, he succeeded where Israel here failed. And Israel weren't fasting, they just wanted a different kind of food to the one that God was providing for them. And, uh, you know, so, so it's kind of... Um, you know, sort of bad news all the way here. It's moaning and groaning and God judging them. Now, also in chapter 11, you get the story of two, two guys called Eldad and Medad, all right? And what happens is that Eldad and Medad, the Holy Spirit comes on them and they begin prophesying. Now, Joshua, who was a young lad at this point, and who was eventually to take over from Moses when he died and lead the people into the Promised Land. Joshua, uh, you know, he, he was like a, an apprentice. I mean, he spent loads of time with Moses. Moses, if you like, was his um, mentor, and, and, and God was preparing Joshua for his future. And, you know, Joshua was very close to Moses, like learning, as it were, spiritually from the Master. And uh, when Eldad and Medad started to prophesy, Joshua... Um, got a kind of, he, he got insecure on behalf of Moses. And he started thinking, oh goodness, Eldad and Medad are prophesying, but Moses is leader. Oh goodness, what happens if people start following Medad and Eldad instead of Moses? Can you see what I mean? And he felt threatened on behalf of Moses, because here God was blatantly moving through two people other than Moses. And, you know, and sort of like, so he says his bit. But Moses, you know, when he finds out how Joshua is feeling, Moses rather than being threatened in any way that two other people are prophesying, he is absolutely delighted. He is delighted. He said, oh, you know, if all the people would prophesy. That really tells us something about the man Moses. He wasn't a man who felt threatened and had to keep his position at all costs. He was secure in the Lord. So the fact that God was using other people, although Joshua saw it as a threat to his mentor, Moses didn't see it as a threat to him at all. He said, well, if God is using so-and-so, well, praise the Lord, that's absolutely marvellous. He's using both of us. You know, Moses didn't feel, oh, goodness, I'm a bit threatened. I've got to put them down so that people know that I'm the big boss. I mean, you know, Moses, there's a really good picture of, you know, what leadership ought to be there. And uh, then, we're still in chapter 11, you have the, um, do you remember, we, we saw back in Exodus 18, um, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, and... Uh, advised him about doing, you know, the leadership, the pyramid thing, all right, so that he wasn't taking on too much himself. Well, it's at this point that Moses appoints 70 elders and begins to set up that kind of leadership structure. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, again, why is he taking the, you know, puts it, setting into action the advice that his father-in-law had given him uh, some months before? And, um, you know, so, so that's fine. And then they, they, they move off to um, the next place called Hazaroth. Now then, in chapter 12, um, Aaron and Miriam come to the fore here. Now, we've got to remind ourselves, Aaron is the high priest, and Aaron is Moses' brother, all right? Now, Moses also had a sister called Miriam. Now, Miriam was a prophetess, so she was recognised as being a woman through whom the Lord spoke. Now, what happens here is that Mo Aaron and Miriam now begin to display a jealousy towards the position that Moses holds as the leader of God's people. And what's happened here is that Moses has married 
a Cushite bride, all right, a Cushite girl, um, which was no, no problem whatsoever. There was no reason he shouldn't. If this Cushite girl was a believer on the Lord God of Israel, there was no earthly reason why Moses shouldn't have married her, all right? But what they do is that they use his marriage to this Cushite girl as a pretext to start murmuring against him. So it begins with, oh, have you seen what Moses has done? That Cushite girl. And then they start, you know, the whole thing begins to get out of, um, you know, context. And it, it just, you know, mushrooms, you know, makes a, a mountain out of a molehill. And in fact, it's in, in this chapter in verse 3 where we're told that Moses was the humblest man on earth. All right? That Moses was the most humble human being alive at that time. And, you know, we've just seen, haven't we, that when Moses realises that God is using other people and not just him, he's delighted rather than being threatened. He's delighted. That was the humility of, um, of Moses. And now what happens is that Moses, uh, sorry, Aaron and Miriam now, having started off with the fact that Moses had married this Cushite, they then, in their murmuring, because one th when it's murmuring, it always goes from one thing to the next, all right? And what they end up with is accusing Moses of pride and arrogance, and that Moses didn't want anyone else to be used by God except him. And this became the basis of their moaning and accusation against Moses. Now, the point is that this particular accusation is 100% false. Moses wasn't proud. Moses wasn't someone who was, I, I'm going to be the only one used by God. We've established in the last two chapters that Moses was the exact opposite to that. He was delighted when God used people other than himself. He was the humblest man on the earth. And yet here, his brother and his sister, because of their jealousy of the position that he's got as a leader over them, now they're fabricating all these accusations and now they're into complete 100% false accusations against him. And now they're virtually leading a rebellion against him. And they're getting people together. Oh, isn't this terrible? Moses shouldn't be our leader, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, Moses is a wise leader, and he doesn't, he doesn't fight for himself. He, he kind of, he rests in the Lord, and he lets the Lord fight for him. And he, he doesn't do anything, all right? He, he doesn't start having fisticuffs and, and well, what do you think you're saying, or, yeah, anything like that. He just leaves it, and the Lord fights for him. And Miriam becomes leprous. She gets leprosy. Which, which, which rather kind of decided the issue. And so she, according to the instructions that they got um, back in, what was it, chapter 6 about skin diseases, <laughs> Miriam is duly marched outside the camp and not allowed to come back. Because lepro you know, sort of, if, if you had leprosy, you were put outside the camp because you were a danger to other people. So now Miriam is wandering around as an outcast outside the camp. And uh, you know, the fact that Aaron is probably, he was under Miriam's thumb. You know, Miriam was probably the strong one here. Uh, and, and Aaron, to a certain extent, just, just, just being bullied by his sister, you know, and that's why he wasn't sent out. But, nevertheless, it didn't last for long, and the Lord heals her, and she comes back in. And then everything's all right, and they, they repent, you know, so, so they learn their lesson, and, and everything works out fine. And, um, and then the Lord moves Israel on to the um, desert of Paran, which is at the southernmost region of the Promised Land. Now, that's quite significant. Israel, in just a few weeks, they've actually got to the Promised Land, okay? Now then, in chapter 13, we have uh, the story of um, the spies who were sent in to the Promised Land to have a, a reconnoitre. And uh, there are 12, 12 men, one from each tribe, and they're sent in. You know, they're right on the borders of Canaan now, and uh, they're sent in to spy out the land. And um, if you read through the list, you get a guy called Hoshea. That is Joshua. It's just another way of writing Joshua. So Joshua is one of the guys who goes in. And uh, they, they, they return, right, these 12 guys, and they report back to the nation. And they report back two things. And uh, firstly, they report back how incredibly beautiful and fantastically fertile the land was. The best land visually and agriculturally that they could imagine. So they came back saying, this is absolutely 100% superb, all right. And the second thing that they reported back is that the inhabitants were far too strong. There were giants who made them look like grasshoppers and the whole idea of going in and taking the land was absolutely impossible and out of the question. Caleb, who was one of the 12, speaks up at this point and says, no, it's no problem, let's go into the land, like God has said. But 
the others, they were all saying, no, no chance at all. And what happens now in chapter, 30, uh, in, in chapter 14 um, is that, that, that now, having had this report, all right, uh, the whole nation has a, a go at Moses and Aaron, saying that, that wouldn't it be better if they'd have just died in Egypt or died in the wilderness? And, um, you know, and the, at the very least, wouldn't it now be time to think about going back to Egypt? Yeah, having forgotten if they had, I mean, they'd have been wiped out anyway, because, I mean, they were responsible for Pharaoh and the army being killed. They didn't have many fans back in Egypt, I can assure you. And, and so, you know, again, the moaning and the, oh, it's too hard. Oh, goodness, can't we? And, and this is the crazy thing, this strange idea that they had it better in the past. Even before they got into the land, they'd never had it so good. There was no one oppressing them. There was no one whipping them, no one beating them. They had all the manna they could eat. You know, life was great compared to what they come out of, but how easily we forget the blessings that we've got now, let alone looking forward to the blessings that God has yet got for us. And so all the people are moaning and groaning now, you know, and having a sort of like, you know, kind of a rebel against Moses and Aaron. It's all their fault. It's always the leader's fault, right? And, uh, but now Caleb, or, or, all right, um, is joined by Joshua, okay, and... Um, and they, they kind of, they speak to the people and they're saying, look, you know, don't, don't have a go at Moses and Aaron. Look, they're saying the, the, the Canaanites are no problem. And they say, look, God is with us. We can go in, we can take the land because God is with us. And the nation, having heard what they say, have a debate amongst themselves. And the motion is put forward that they start by stoning Caleb and Joshua. So Caleb and Joshua are speaking out of faith, we can trust the Lord. And now the people, they avert their attack from Moses and Aaron and say, let's stone Joshua and Caleb. Then, then God steps in and speaks to the nation. And uh, he, he says, he says that, look, right now, you know, you've had it. And he says that apart from Joshua and Caleb, apart from those two, the, 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 the two of the, 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 you know, the two spies who actually trusted him, God said, that from that point, not one person from that generation who were alive then would get into the land. Only Joshua and Caleb would. And God said that the rest of them would die in the wilderness and that their children would go in instead. And that is exactly what happened. And then the ten spies who came back with all the, oh, we can't do it because, you know, sort of, you know, the people are too big and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Lord kills them in front of the people as a judgment for their unbelief. And, um, you know, so, so the nation looks on and uh, takes that to heart. Anyway, the next morning, all right, because now God has said, you're not going in. The next morning, people wake up and say, right, we're going in. <laughs> right? So they get an army together and they, they go into the promised land. I mean, this is fickleness. When God was saying go in, they said no. Then God said, right, now you can't. And they said, right, we're going. And they get an army, they go in, and of course, you know, Moses, speaking on behalf of the Lord, says, no, don't go in, it's too late. The Lord has said that you can't, so don't. But the people take no notice at all, and they go in and they get absolutely marmalised by the Amalekites and the Canaanites, and they get thoroughly beaten up. And, um, you know, and, and, and this was absolutely, you know, sort of like the, the absolute fruit of unbelief, and rebellion, and uh, I just want to um, actually read you uh, just just one one verse from this because it, it it says something you know that we really need to to underline in our hearts, and uh, it's it's verse eleven. So um, this is chapter fourteen and verse eleven, and and just the Lord said to Moses, "How long will these people treat me with contempt?" How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I've performed amongst them? Now, there, the Lord says that don't you realise that unbelief is holding me in contempt? And it is. We're very soft on unbelief, aren't we? You know, I mean, our unbelieving hearts, you know. I mean, it's not for no purpose that the Bible talks about the evil heart of unbelief. Uh, you know, and here God's saying to the people, look, you're just holding me in contempt. Basically, you're calling me a liar. I mean, that is the dreadful thing about unbelief. And, uh, you know, so, so this kind of really ends a chapter and the army comes back thoroughly beaten, thoroughly, you know, sort of like demoralised. And uh, then, then in, in chapter 15 you get various laws and um, you get the, the, the story of a Sabbath breaker who's, who's actually stoned to death by the nation.
Anyway, then, then in chapter 16, all right, we, we get another rebellion against Moses, all right? And uh, this is a bloke called Korah. Now, he's a Levite. This is one of Moses' kind of, you know, like, you know, fellow leaders. This is a priest. And uh, this guy, Korah, gets together with um, Dathan and Abiram, and they, they arrange a coup, a coup d'etat against Moses. It's a, it's a bloodless coup. But what they try to do is to set up an alternative leadership and priesthood. So they want to have a complete alternative system. Not only rejecting Moses as the leader God has appointed, but they want to set up a different priesthood. And uh, 250 people join them. And what Moses does, he says, right, okay, look, let's, let's, let's have a contest and see who the Lord's with. So Moses stood in one place, all right, and these guys stood in another place with all their families and their possessions. And what happens is the earth opens up beneath their feet and they physically, they go alive into Sheol. So, um, you know, sort of like contest... <laughs> you know, contest um, over. And, um, and the 250 people who followed Korah are consumed by fire. So, so God leaves no doubt as to um, who he's actually with. Uh, the next day, the nation gets together for a parlay and they accuse Moses and Aaron of murdering them. They, they tell Moses, and it's your fault that they went, you know, that they got burned up by the Lord. And you can see the fickleness of it. It didn't matter what Moses did. He, he was... He was the people always had good reason for saying it's Moses' fault and it's Aaron's fault, right? Because if you've got rebellion against God, you're going to get rebellion against his designated leadership. It's always the way it works. And, um, and in response to, to, to this accusation that Moses and Aaron had murdered Korah and his, you know, sort of like cronies, uh, the Lord sends a plague amongst Israel and 14,700 of them are killed. So, you know, the Lord makes a, a point there. And it was only Moses praying that stopped the law from wiping the entire nation out. The Lord decided, he said, look, I want to wipe the whole lot out and I want to start again just with you, Moses. But Moses loved the people so much, he said, no, Lord, don't. Don't. Keep giving them all the chances that they need. And, you know, that was Moses' love interceding for the people and so the Lord stayed his hand. So there's another, you know, sort of thing there about Moses as a leader. Even though these people really gave him a hard time, he stuck in there with them. His commitment was to them. He wasn't just... Uh, in effect, God was saying, Moses, do you want to cut and run and I'll give you something better? And Moses said, no, Lord, I belong with these people. That's where my heart is. So that, that's commitment. And, of course, that's also the commitment that the Lord has for us as well. Now, then, in chapter 17, to, to settle things once and for all, Moses takes a staff from each tribe. So he gets the leaders of the tribes together and he takes one staff from each tribe and, uh, or, or each tribe's leader. So he's got 12 staffs here. And uh, he engraves their names on it. And uh, so the tribe of Levi, the staff from that tribe has Aaron's name engraved in it. Now what Moses then did is he put these staffs, one from each tribe, um, into the tabernacle overnight, all right? And then what happened was the next morning, Aaron's staff, the staff of Levi with Aaron's name on, had budded and it started to grow flowers on it. And that settled once and for all that Levi was God's choice for the priesthood. Do you see what I mean? It settled it once and for all. And Moses says, look, we've got to close this chapter. Here is all the proof you need that, 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 that Aaron and his descendants, the tribe of Levi, are God's appointed priests and assistants. And so again, ending the argument over, you know, who, who should do what, as it were. And then what happens is, Moses, this staff, or this rod that has budded, Aaron's rod, it's then put in the Ark of the Covenant, which has already got the tablets with the Ten Commandments on. So that went in there and it stayed there. Now in chapters 18 to 19, um, you get yet more instructions concerning the priests and the Levites. And um, among these things being the fact that the Levites as a tribe were to have no inheritance in the Promised Land. We'll see when we come on to the book of Joshua, um, you know, sort of like how the different tribes were allocated different parts of the land. But Levi, the Levites as a tribe, were to get no inheritance at all. Um, but they were to be supported and to receive their finances and money by the tithes and offerings from the people. So there you have the beginning of the tithing system, which was actually Israel's tax system. Uh, nothing to do with giving, tithing in the church today. I mean, tithing has no place in the church. But tithing here is introduced because the Levites, who were the full-time workers in a religious sense, but also the administrators and the judges, socially, etc., etc., you know, if you like, they were the local council, parliament, everything 
rolled into one. And the tithing system was the tax system, so the rest of the tribes who had land so they could make money had to give money to the Levites and support them because they had no means of making money for themselves because they didn't have any land upon which to make the money, as it were. So you get that in chapters 18 to 19. And um, chapter 20, the next chapter, now jumps 38 years. <laughs> so the basic, we've seen up to now, and, and, and then the next 38 years are just jumped over. Because that was 38 years of more of the same. I mean, the sort of thing we've been seeing went on for 38 years all over the place. And, you know, and the Bible kind of, it's almost as if God says, I'm not telling you anymore. It's too laborious. So now we jump 38 years, all right, and in chapter 20. And uh, now we're coming to the end of Israel's time in the wilderness. And in chapter 20, we get the, um, the, 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 the story of the fact that, um, um, that once again in their travels, the, the Israelites come to a place where there's no water. And you'll remember it, you know, sort of like when they first came out of Egypt, there was the thing when they had no water and, you know, Moses struck the rock and the water came out. Now, what happens here um, is that God tells, you know, the people are moaning and groaning, right, blah, 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 and God tells Moses, look, speak to the rock and water will come out. But what Moses does is he loses, he blows his top, and he strikes the rock with his staff, and he yells at them, you rebels and sinners. Now, what happens here is that now, as a result of that, God tells Moses and Aaron that they will not lead the nation into the promised land. And here, God's judgment comes on the two of them for this display of petulance against the people. And of course, the point was that with leadership comes greater responsibility. You know, teachers will be judged more strictly, as it says in James. Now, the point is, here we have a classic example of the people moaning, we're thirsty, and God in his grace gives them water. He doesn't judge them, that's what they deserved. He gives them water. Whereas Moses totally misrepresents God by yelling at them, you rebels and sinners. Now, we've seen before, particularly when we did the Law and Grace series, that Moses is a picture of law. Whereas the promised land is a picture of grace because you receive it by promise. So Moses, he could bring them out of Egypt because the law convicts you of sin and brings you to Jesus, you repent of your sins. But once you've done that, the law has done its work in your life and from then on it's grace. So there's no way Moses can lead the people into the promised land. That, as we'll see, is going to be Joshua. And Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus, Saviour, all right? But the point is, this is the point where God says to Moses, you can't lead the people in because you're all about law, not my grace, and you've just demonstrated it. You've misrepresented me, so you can't go in, all right? And, um, and then you get a story that, that as Israel is going through the wilderness, it takes them through the land of, of, of Edom, and uh, you know, like the Edomite army squares up to them, and they decide, Israel decides, that if we go round them, let's, let's not get into any fights for the time being, and so they, they do that, you know, they avoid this fight with the Edomites. And uh, then the chapter ends with the death of Aaron. Aaron dies at this point, the high priest, and he is succeeded by his son Eleazar. So now we have a new high priest, okay, Eliezer. Then in chapter 21, we have, um, what happens is that some of the, out, you know, as they're travelling around, some of the outlying tribes get attacked by uh, the king of Arad and are taken prisoner by him, and so, uh, you know, he's from inside Canaan. So now the army is just sent into Canaan to rescue uh, the Jews who have been carried off, so there's a skirmish there, and that is complete victory for Israel. Uh, then you get more complaining by the people against God and Moses, you know, same, more of the same. And uh, God sends a judgment amongst them of venomous snakes. So all these snakes appear and are biting them, you know, and after, they, you know, after a few minutes they're dying. And, uh, but the people start repenting. They're learning their lesson. They start crying out to God and saying, sorry. So what God does is he tells Moses to make a bronze snake, all right, and to hold it up. And anyone, once they've been bitten, if they looked up to the snake, this serpent that Moses was holding up high, um, if they looked at it, they were healed, all right? And of course, in John's Gospel, uh, that picture is used of Jesus. You know, that Jesus was lifted up like this serpent, like the serpent here, so that those who looked to him, all right, would be freed of the judgment coming upon them. And of course, the picture that Jesus became sin on the cross, and here, the judgment of serpents, the devil, and it was by making a serpent on the pole that if people looked at the serpent, they were healed. And there's a picture there of the coming crucifixion of Jesus, and you get, you know, sort of reference to that in the Gospel of John. And um, then you get um, 
Uh, then they, they, after that, they journey on to Moab, and uh, they, they get attacked by, by two kings, a king called Sion and Og. Now, Sion was the king of the Amorites, and Og was the king of Bashan. And these two guys have got a coalition, so they turn up with their armies, and, um, you know, sort of like, they attack Israel, um, but Israel is given victory over them. Right, now, in chapter 22... Israel is now camped on the plains of Moab, okay, and uh, not far from Jericho, literally just outside the Promised Land, okay. Jericho is now just the other side of the Jordan. And um, Balak, who was the king of Moab, uh, does a rather silly thing. Now, Israel has absolutely no plans and no guidance from God to attack Moab at all. Moab is irrelevant at this point to Israel. They're just camping there. But Balak, who is the king of Moab, um, gets paranoid and, and is convinced that Israel is going to attack him, which they're not. He's a bit of a twit. All he had to do was go and talk to Moses and he'd have been put at ease, but he doesn't. What he does instead is he calls in a guy called Balaam. Now, Balaam was at the time... You've got to think of Balaam as probably being the world's most renowned sorcerer at that time. He was a practicer of the magical arts, a really powerful occultist. And what happens is that Balak, the king of Moab, calls in Balaam and um, offers to pay him, you know, quite a lot of money, uh, for him to pronounce a curse on Israel, believing that, that, that Balaam has the power to do it and that if he curses Israel, then when Israel attacks Moab, they'll lose the fight. Again, not that Israel is planning to attack Moab at all. Now, the point is, what you've got to understand is that the, the, the surrounding nations and Balak, the king of Moab, and Balaam, they believed in the God of Israel. But they believed in the God of Israel as being on a par with the gods of all the other countries. So they acknowledged the reality of Israel's gods, but just saw him as one of many gods, all right. And so the idea was that with occultism, you could get all the other gods to gang up on him and beat him. That, that was the idea behind this, okay. So, um, believing that gods could be manipulated by spells and magic, this occultist Balaam is brought in to pronounce a curse against Israel, okay. And um, so Balaam, loving money, accepts, and so he, he pronounces a curse. But instead, um, sort of, he goes to do it, and all of a sudden God speaks to him and tells him that he mustn't do it, and stops him. And Balaam can't do it. He tried, but he just couldn't do it. And, um, and you know, sort of like, Balaam gets the ump now, all right, because he he's, you know, wants to do this cursing thing to get his money, and he can't. And then you get the episode with his donkey, when God speaks to him through the mouth of his donkey, you know, just really to make the point, you know, that, that God really was in charge of everything, okay. And, uh, you know, this was, of course, the story that led dear Robert <coughs> some years ago to, um, you know, sort of believe that God, God spoke to him out of the backside of a donkey. Of course, uh, mixing up ass with uh, something else. And, um, you know, so, so here, here, you get this, you know, the story when God prevents Balak pronouncing the curse and speaks to him out of, um, you know, the mouth of, of his donkey. And, uh, but eventually, okay, Balaam gets together with Balak and, um, and, and, and tells Balak that, that, that the great problem is that, that, that he can only speak what the Lord God of Israel gives him to speak. You know, he, he's saying, look, you know, this, this God is quite powerful and I'm afraid that he seems to be in charge around here. I can only speak what he gives me to speak. Now, in chapters 23 to 24, this, this story carries on and that Balak is absolutely determined to get Israel cursed. And he, he positively insists that Balaam proceeds by pronouncing a curse against Israel. And of course, he's offering him more money all the time. And of course, the pound signs in Balak's eyes, in, in Balaam's eyes. And so he goes for it. And uh, so he says, right, OK. So Balaam, he then speaks out a curse against Israel. But as he speaks the curse, this fantastic blessing comes out instead. Now, Balak isn't happy because Balak is paying Balaam to curse Israel, and now he's hearing Balaam bless Israel, and so he suggests that he try again. And so Balaam takes a deep breath, and he speaks out what he thought was going to be a curse, and another fantastic blessing comes out against Israel. Now, Balak then suggests that maybe the problem here is they're doing it in the wrong place. And he says, Balaam, if we go somewhere else, all right, then we might be okay. The idea being that they believed that gods were territorial. So they said, let's go to Peor. So they went to Mount Peor, thinking that the Lord God of Israel might not have any clout on Mount Peor. So off they go to Mount Peor, thinking now that they were safe. Balaam takes a deep breath, speaks out, and out comes blessing number three. All right. 
and uh, it doesn't matter what, he's trying hard to curse Israel, he can't, all that comes out are blessings. Now, Balak now gets a bit, bit, you know, sort of tells him to naff off, <laughs> all right. So Balak tells Balaam where to go and storms off with a huff. And, uh, but, but, but before Balak can actually leave his presence, Balaam now comes out with a fourth blessing, which is the most amazing of the lot, including a prophecy about the coming Messiah, and that a man will come out of this nation, Israel, who will one day rule all the nations of the world. Well, I mean, Balak is not enjoying this at all. You know, he's seeing good money go down the drain here. And then Balaam continues to prophesy against all the surrounding nations. And I mean, now there's just no stopping him. And uh, having done that, then they all go home. Balak unhappy, Balaam unhappy. Balak won't give him the money, Balaam hasn't got the money, and all beaten by the Lord God of Israel. And of course the point is, what God, you know, the moral of this story is that God isn't one of many. He is the God. You cannot manipulate God. And if you try, he has a million ways of sorting you out. Now then, we've got to ask a question here. Does this mean Balaam, this occultist, having pronounced all these blessings you know, on, on Israel and even <coughs> prophesied of the coming of the Messiah. Does it mean that he was a believer and he got converted or something? Well, the answer is no. He wasn't a believer. He was an occultist. Remember, he believed that, that, that the Lord God of Israel was one God among many. As far as he saw, this God just won this round, you know. And, uh, you know, but he was simply being, as it were, overpowered by the Lord, all right? You know, it was literally the Lord overruling his mouth. He wanted to curse. And in fact, we'll see a bit later on how Balak, who in the New Testament is clearly um, indicated to not have been a believer at all, but a thoroughly demonic person, we'll see later how Balak tries to take his revenge on Israel and on their God, because he was not pleased that he was beaten on this occasion. So we move into uh, chapter 25, and what happens now is that the um, many of the Israelite men are now seduced by the surrounding Moabite women. They were there for quite a long time. They were mixing, you know, I mean, obviously Balak Bay, Bay realised they weren't going to invade after all, and, you know, so they're mixing in with that society. And uh, the Moabite women um, seduce the Israelite men who become immoral, and they start to worship the Moabite god called Baal. So now Israel enters into immorality and Baal worship. And uh, God, God sends a plague amongst them and many of them die. Now this plague is averted when, remember, Aaron has died and his son Eleazar is now the high priest. Well Eleazar had a son called Phinehas, alright, and this plague was ended when Phinehas executes an Israelite man and the Moabite woman whom he is fornicating with and he kills them both and that um, averts the plague. Sorry, it wasn't, sorry, it was a Midianite girl. The Midianites got in on this as well, and he executes a Jewish man who was fornicating with a Midianite. Okay, so the Midianites have joined in with Moab, and they're seducing the Israelite men through their women, all right? And it's at this point that God says to Israel that Midian has become a, a, a sort of a, your foe, and you must eventually destroy the Midianites. Now then, in chapter 26, we get the second census, all right? Because the generation that was alive when the first census was taken is now dead, apart from Caleb and Joshua and Moses, all right? All the others are dead. So a new generation has arisen, and now a census of them is taken. And uh, the first census um, was uh, numbering 603,550, but now they're slightly less, and the males 20 years and over, now number 601,730. So there's the second numbering. The first numbering being the generation who came out of Egypt. Now the second numbering, this are going to be the generation who under Joshua are going to actually go into the promised land. Then in chapter 27, um, you get various other laws outlined now. And uh, you get laws concerning daughters inheriting property when there are no sons or no brothers uh, for the father to leave it to. Uh, so quite a bit there on the rights of women. Um, women tended to end up the chattels of the men in Israel, but that was only because Israel wasn't being faithful to the law. The Jewish women actually were unique amongst the women of the world. They, they had many more rights than certainly the uh, women in the Gentile nations. And uh, so you get laws about that, the inheritance laws and leaving it to daughters when there's no sons. And uh, then it's at this point that Joshua 
is announced as being the successor of Moses. Um, and Moses lays hands on him to commission him. And uh, so again, what we've got, Moses brought them out of Egypt. But Moses couldn't lead them into Canaan. Because the law got them out of Egypt. The law convicts of sin and brings us to Jesus. But once we come to Jesus, it's grace all the way, no more law. And so the promised land being a picture of the Christian life and spiritual warfare, now it's Joshua, which is Jesus, the same name, it's Joshua who's going to lead them from this point. So they've passed out from under law, now they're under grace, aren't we? We are not under law, but under grace. So there, Moses, uh, Joshua now replaces Moses. Um, chapters 28 to 30, you get more details on festivals, offerings, vows, etc., etc. Miscellaneous laws, I'm not going to go into them here. Then, chapter 31, and uh, we, we move on now to, to Moses' last official act of leadership before he passes off the scene completely. And uh, we saw earlier, do you remember when Israel was seduced by the Moabite women and the Midianites and got into idolatry? God pronounced judgment on the Midianites for that. Well, now, Moses, his last act as Israel's leader was that uh, he sent the Israel off, uh, he, sorry, he sent the army of Israel off to attack and to defeat the Midianites and to destroy them. Remember we saw that back in chapter 25, the seduction of the men by the Moabites and the Midianites and ending up with the men worshipping Baal because they were enticed through the immorality of their women, all right? And, um, and so the army is now dispatched by Moses to attack the Midianites and to destroy them. And uh, the attack is led by Phinehas. Remember Phinehas, Eliezer's son, the one who executed the Jewish man with the Midianite woman and averted the judgment of God. So he leads the army on this occasion, all right, even though he was a priest. And uh, what happens is the Midianites consisted of five separate nations in coalition. So you had five kings, and all five kings are defeated and killed. Now, if you just actually turn to chapter 31 and find verse 8, just a little detail that we need to see here. And it's this, verse 8, among their victims, now these are the victims when Israel went in to destroy the Midianites, among their victims were Evi, Arechem, Zer, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. So Balaam is now killed and there he is amongst the Midianites. Why is that? Go down to verse 16. And um, speaking about the women, it says, they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened at Peor, so a plague struck the Lord's people. Now, can you see how after Balaam was defeated again and again by God and couldn't pronounce the curse against Israel. Can you see the vengeance he decided to enact against both Israel and against the Lord God of Israel? He put the Midianites and the Moabites up to the idea of sending their women in to seduce the Israelite men and get them into idolatry. And that was the revenge of Balaam. And that is one of the reasons that he figures in New Testament teaching. Because, of course, what is one of the things that Satan, through false teachers and false teaching in general, what is one of the things that Satan does in order to destroy Christians' um, walk with the Lord? Enticing them with worldliness. Isn't it? We all know that. Satan all the time enticing us with worldliness. That is the sin of Balaam. And sadly, you get in the church people who do represent the sin of Balaam, leading God's people into immorality and the sins of the flesh, or whatever. And so here, judgment is executed on Balaam as well. And um, so, you know, we can see clearly that Balaam, he hadn't become a believer at all. He was a hater of God. He was an occultist. And, uh, you know, so the battle is very successful. Uh, Israel goes back to the camp and they've got all the spoil from the Midianites and they kind of, um, you know, divide it out amongst everyone so they share all the spoil, all the booty out. And uh, then, then in chapter 32 we get a kind of um, 
a story here that you 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 need to underline because we're going to see this um, you know again and again it's uh, an important fact uh, remember they're getting ever closer that all the people know all the tribes know that very very soon they are going to be going into the promised land the designated land that God has given them now what happens at this point is that uh, you know they've been um, you know kind of encamped for some while just outside of Moab at the southernmost tip of the promised land so not in the promised land outside of it the promised land is across Jordan they're the other side of Jordan now what happens here that two of the tribes Reuben and Gad they they kind of fall in love with this area where they've been encamped and they think wouldn't this be a wonderful place if we could settle this will do us very nicely rather than end up settled actually in the promised land it's so lovely here this is where we would like our inheritance to be and so what they do is that they approach <coughs> Moses and actually request that they be allowed to remain where they now are in that area of land outside of Canaan and they say to Moses look would it be okay you know like check it out with the Lord do you think it would be all right if we stay here because it's lovely and we really like it here now what Moses puts to them is that he said now the problem is with what you're saying is that it rather smacks to me of the same kind of unbelief that stopped us going into the land 38 years ago because he's saying look the rest of us if we go into Canaan we've got a lot of fighting to do you know the Canaanites have to be dislodged and here you are asking if you can stay here where there's no fighting to be done you know, so he's saying, so what am I to make of it? You know, you know, are you sure it isn't that you just want to shirk your responsibilities? And so what they do is that they suggest a compromise to Moses. And what they say is, look, when you, you know, if, if it's okay for us to settle here, to stay here, to make this land our inheritance, then when the rest of you actually go across the Jordan into Canaan, what we'll do we'll leave our families and our possessions and our flocks and everything here but all us men we will come into the promised land with you and we will fight in the army and we will keep fighting until you've all got the you know the parts of Canaan that are for you and only when the fighting is over we'll come back and settle here so they say to Moses how does that sound to you and given that particular you know sort of compromise Moses says that's no problem that's fair enough and at this point half of the tribe of Manasseh decide that they would like to remain in that area with Reuben and Gad so the compromise is accepted and what happens from this point onwards is that Reuben and Gad and half Manasseh become known as the Transjordan tribes so that what happens is that as the rest of the tribes, the other nine tribes and the other half of, of, um, of Manasseh, as they settle in the promised land, Gad, Reuben and half of Manasseh, when the fighting is all over, they go back to this part of the land, the other side of the Jordan, outside of Canaan, and they settle here. So what you've got is that some of the nation of Israel is outside the land with the rest of the nation of Israel inside the promised land and the two and a half tribes outside of the promised land just the other side of Jordan not far away but just the other side of Jordan those two and a half tribes become known as the Transjordan tribes Reuben, Gad and half Manasseh so we'll see more of that as we move on in later talks and see the actual going in um, and you know sort of like um, you know establishing the nation in Canaan and we'll see also various complications that this arrangement brought about albeit at no time does God revoke it so this arrangement did have the blessing of God but as we're going to see in future talks there were times when it led <coughs> to a certain amount of confusion and misunderstanding amongst God's people but basically God allowed it it was no problem now in chapter 33 we, we have what you might call an historical interlude and what happens now is that in one chapter you get a breakdown of this 38 year wilderness wanderings you get a breakdown 
in purely geographical terms. So if you like, you get a verbal map drawn of their journeys. And even though most of their time in the wilderness isn't actually covered, it's jumped over, all right, the details, but because we've got this chapter, we, do, we can trace their entire wanderings in the wilderness, all right. So uh, you get that historical breakdown in chapter 33, the, all the 38 years um, in the wilderness from the geographical point of view. And uh, it's at this point as well that God actually tells them that when you go into Canaan, you must drive out and destroy all the Canaanites. Now that is foundational, that God told them from the outset that his judgment was on the Canaanites and they were to be thoroughly evicted and destroyed. The point being that Israel, when they went in, weren't to start sharing things with the Canaanites. If they did, they would simply end up compromising with all the satanic and idolatrous practices. And so Israel were commanded here that they were to drive out and destroy the Canaanites completely as they went into the land. To Israel's cost, again as we shall see in future talks, they failed to do that and uh, with dire consequences um, to them. And uh, in chapter 34, you, you now have details of the actual boundaries of, of Canaan um, set and, and like who, you know, which tribe gets which bits and, and who's going to be apportioned what and how it gets apportioned. And it's set out here that Joshua and Eleazar the high priest are to supervise the allotment of the land to the various tribes. Now, when we come on to do the book of Joshua, we will see that again in detail, who gets what, okay. Um, and then chapter 35, uh, we, we have here the teaching on the, uh, the cities for the Levites. Now, what, what happens here is that uh, 48 cities are to be set apart for the Levites. Now, remember, the Levites got no inheritance in the land. They were the servants to the Lord and they were the administrators of the nation. They didn't get any land. They were the one tribe who didn't, all right. So what happened, I, I, you know, because they were spread out over all of Israel. I mean, every, every little... Every, you know, down to the last little village, every little, you know, sort of uh, group of people in the land had the Levites. So, you know, these guys were spread out over the whole land into all the territories, all right. And uh, they were all over the place and supported by the people that they actually served. And, uh, but what happens is that 48 cities are to be set apart for the Levites, all right. And um, also, you have here the laws set out for what were to be called the cities of refuge. Now, the cities of refuge uh, were mainly populated by the Levites, as these other 48 cities were to be. And uh, what happened was that with a city of refuge, it was um, a kind of an aid to justice. And what would happen, obviously, if, if someone was murdered, I mean, Israel didn't have a police force, so each community was responsible for policing itself. So that if, if, if someone had committed a murder, then they were to be brought to trial and executed by the local community amongst whom they committed the crime. All right. But obviously, there could be, you know, and of course the witness against them had to cast the first stone and all that sort of thing. Now, there was a potential problem in that accidents happen. And you could have one or two scenarios. You could have an accidental killing that was purely accidental. I mean, two blokes might be working together, you know, and one, you know, sort of like dropped something on the other one's head and killed him. You know, acci completely accidental. Or you might have another scenario where two people end up having a fist fight, a quarrel, and, and no one meant to kill anyone, but, but in the fight one ends up hitting the other two hard harder than they meant, and he gets killed. Now, they're, they are examples where people have lost their lives, but you haven't got the committing of premeditated murder. And the law was very clear that people were to be put to death for premeditated murder not accidental killing, i.e. manslaughter wasn't a capital event. Now then, the problem was that when the community policed itself, all right, it was very likely that, say you accidentally killed someone, well, it's very possible you're going to have their family after you and they're going to want your blood, even though you haven't actually committed a crime worthy of being killed for. So what happened was, anyone who had killed someone could flee to a city of refuge. Once they got there, the Levites gave them, if you like, political sanction, and no one was allowed to lay a hand on them. They, you know, they were given political asylum, rather not sanction, political asylum, and they were protected. And what happened was, when anyone came to a city claiming refuge or asylum, the Levites within that city would set about thoroughly investigating the crime 
that had caused the person to flee to them. Now, if the Levites established that the person who had run away had actually murdered, then the Levites would hand the person over to that community for them to be stoned to death and for justice to be carried out in a community where the crime had taken place. But if the Levites ascertained that it was accidental and a murder hadn't...